to P100 or not P100? That is the question. I think that was a famous quote from our friend Bill Shakespeare. I am an engineer though, so I might be wrong about that. Welcome back to another Mass Nerd video. Now you might have seen an ad starting at this video and maybe one in the middle from a, the ever handsome Ryan Reynolds telling you to go to Mint Mobile or some holiday themed ad. Luckily the political, political ones are over. There's a good reason for that. I'll be monetizing this channel and taking all of the money and donating it to the legal fund of Marwa Zatari. There's a GoFundMe link as well below that if you have a moment to jump over and donate some money, I would really appreciate it. Marwa is an indoor air quality scientist who's been a vocal advocate for using uh, HEPA filters and a lot of other uh, tools to help reduce the uh, COVID-19 inhaled dose. Um, and one of the things that she's brought to attention is that the claims of bipolar ionization have really not panned out to as much as they think or they have said that they do. And one of the largest manufacturers of them have sued her in federal court. It's going to be very expensive to defend and has set up a legal defense fund uh, at the GoFundMe link. I think scientists and engineers should be able to speak freely and clearly without being fear of a large lawsuit that could financially ruin them. So if you have a moment to help, please do. It's very important to me. I've never asked for any money before, but this might be the only time. And it's not for me. Let's help out other scientists. So if you have a moment, jump over there and donate. So today's video is are P100s really much better than in 95s What's the pros and cons? And we'll cover it today. Now, one of the questions that you most commonly see is that, well, P100 must be better because it's 100 is better than 95. It's, you know, that means there's less particles coming through it. And they're 100% correct. But I think we'll pop into some of the details of that in today's video. Now, the first question that you might ask yourself is, what is the difference between N100, P100, and an N95? I'll throw up a table here showing the commonly used styles of respirators. Um, in fact, almost all of them. Now, when you look at the NIOSH rating system, there's two things. There's first a letter, in this case, either an N, an R, and a P, which represents a non-oily aerosol, partially accepted in oils, or oily aerosols, or uh, P, which is that they're oil resistant, so they can handle oily aerosols. And then the two numbers represent the filtration efficiency, 95 for 95%, 99 for 99, and 100, which kind of rounds easily when you're talking 99.97. Uh, what's about this oil resistance? Why does that matter? Well, it turns out that the filtration media in common uh, P100s, like this style here from Spirion, is that uh, when the use electrostatic melt blown, the oily particles are one, harder to filter because they're nonpolar. It's hard to produce a mirror charge on them to get them to capture that electrostatic filter. And when they do capture, they steal some of that charge away. And so that's a problem with oily filter uh, type situ or oily uh, aerosol type situations. So they have a special standard for when you're dealing with that. That means that the oily particles where you're machining or doing something with liquids, uh, when they get generated, this mass can accumulate them and not impact the filtration efficiency, meaning the device will still provide great protection even when exposed to oily aerosols. That is not the case, let's say, for an N95. If you were to expose that to lots of oily aerosols, it might drop over time depending on who exactly makes it and some other stuff. But in general, that's why that recommendation exists. So do you need a P100? Well, in the terms of context of COVID, no. Most COVID, all COVID aerosols are really non-oily aerosols. They're primarily going to be salt and mucus based with maybe a hint of a virus in there if you like them. Uh, so with those type of situations, you don't really need a P100, but they are the most common. It's kind of actually kind of harder to find an N100 mask than it is to P100 because these are commonly used uh, for asbestos mitigations as well as a lot of other things. If you're working with lead paint or asbestos, definitely use a P100 and get fit tested because uh, you want to make sure that the filtration efficiency is actually being provided to you. But I'm going to make today the argument about that they may not be as necessary when we talk about COVID respiratory aerosols, and I'll try to make the case about why. Not that I have any problem with anyone wearing them. Go ahead. You can always wear, uh, you know, it's like going to a party. It's better to be overdressed than underdressed. But in some ways, I do feel like a P100 is being overdressed. So the, one of the big trade-offs when we talk about P100s, and we talk about that ability to filter oily aerosols at really high filtration efficiencies uh, and be able to load with them, is that the filter media has to be a little bit, there has to be more of it, and it has to be a different style. And typically what we find is that the breathability of P100s is much lower than that of an N95. One, it has to have filter at a higher rate, and again, it has to filter those oily aerosols at really high rates. And so that's typically what we see. Now, it's a very complex topic, and I'll try to make the case to you today about why I think that it's better to focus first on face fit before focusing on improvements in filtration. And to do that, we're going to go to a lengthy, nerdy science discussion. It'll be quick, I promise. 
When scientists try to estimate rates of COVID, we use something called the quanta or quantum. And it's basically a calculation about how many aerosols are generated, how do they float around, how many go into your body, and what's the probability that you get infected. It's a, it's a really simple way of lumping a whole bunch of complex stuff into one simple equation. It was first done by Wells and Riley in around 1945. It's, it uses an exponential curve, uh, and it's a good simple engineering solution. It's not perfect because it doesn't capture everything. Charles Haas, who's a very smart dude out of Drexler, has a great blog about dose response functions, which are not really included in the quanta calculation. And I think is actually very important because dose response functions include things like vaccination and previous uh, immunity by uh, acquired infection. And those are not included in this type of stuff. So it's our best guess estimate. So I'm gonna use it today. I also have a link to that spreadsheet, uh, as well as the cal calculations which come from Jose Jimenez and his uh, spreadsheet. Great spreadsheet, it's been reviewed by Lizzie Marr, uh, Shelley Miller, Don Milton, some of the greats out of the US in terms of airborne infectious disease specialty. So uh, I'm gonna use that calculator. I'll give you a link to it and you'll get a spreadsheet, link to the spreadsheet which I use to calculate all the stuff below. So that's just my disclaimer. If you wanna talk more about it, uh, maybe another video. Okay, so let's quickly talk about that. I'm gonna first throw up, uh, I got a printed copies in front of me to make it easy. I'm first gonna pull up my assumptions about this analysis. I'm gonna to toss them up there. So the first thing is uh, there's different respirators that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about no mask, a cloth mask, surgical, N95, N99, and then an N100, P100. I'm gonna lump them together just because it's close enough for this analysis, but there could be some further distinctions made um, there. I'm one thing gonna also assume some filtration efficiency at 0.3 micron. So for a cloth mask, I assume it's about 55% effective. For a surgical mask, 95%, which I think based on my data is pretty close. Surgical mask, or sorry, N95 at 99.3. Hey, what the heck, N95s, I thought they were 95. As you've seen from my data, NIOSH's test data, lots of test data, N95s typically perform much higher at initial filtration. Remember, they're rated for 200 milligrams of loading, which is a metric crap ton. <laughs> so they typically start out very, very high uh, in terms of filtration efficiency. In terms of COVID and most, rest, most indoor use, you're never getting anywhere close to 200 milligrams. For the N99, based on some of the data that I have from N99s that I've tested, I assumed 99.8%. And for an N100, P100, I'm just going to use the rated value at 99.97%. I don't have a test setup that's good enough to resolve that. I have only tested, I think, one P100 or two P100s in that list. Uh, and so that's for me. So we'll use that for our assumption. It does change it very slightly, but if you actually go in the spreadsheet and change those numbers, you can see it update. It doesn't have a huge effect on the analysis. Now, pressure drop, also important. We're gonna assume some increasing pressure drops with increasing filtration efficiency. These are based on what I think are good average values for those type of devices. So there are, it's a range of E-Flex versus a very poor quality N95, very different in pressure drop, same with P100s, but we'll put it up there. So there's the pressure drop data. Now, the most important thing in this analysis is about face leakage. So we always talk about it's, it's very important that the, that the uh, air goes through the mask, not around the mask, and face leakage is a dominant thing. So even if you have, let's say in this case, a 99.97 filtration media, but 30% of the air goes around it, you're not gonna get 99.97% filtration efficiency. And in my table, I have the face leakage, which I'll toss up next. So face leakage for these style of masks are assumed at different levels. So we have 30%, 10%, 5%. Those are different improvements in how well this mask is sealing to your face. And then you have 1%, which is a fit factor of 100, which would be the requirement if you're in a workplace setting. Uh, half a percent, that's a fit factor of 200. That's a really good fit. That's gonna be the highest that you can technically record on a port account. Um, and then the last one is 0.2%, which is a fit factor of 500. You're knocking it out of the park at that point. And so what we can see is that the face leakage really dominates. So you can look through that table and it shows you, you know, for example, if we look at the N95, 30% uh, leakage, you're getting 69.5% filtration efficiency. But if you go all the way to 0.2 or a fit factor of 500, we're basically at 99.1 filtration efficiency because most of the air is now going through the filter media. This is really important because leakage is what's gonna dominate when you have really high filtration efficiencies. You can see right away that N100 versus a N95 at 5% leakage is pretty similar, 94.3 versus 95%. So how does this translate into risk? And I think this is where Jose Jimenez's calculator, who's from CU Boulder, and I forgot to mention that, very smart person, uh, helps give us context to all this, because I think that's the most important thing. We could look at these numbers, and this, most people are gonna say, well, that's, well, that's basically the same, but what does it mean? What does it bias? And what we're really after is reducing the probability of us getting COVID. So I converted these numbers to be used into Jose Jimenez's calculator, and I'm gonna throw those up here as well. So these numbers represent the assumption, the following assumption. It's the risk assessment at two air changes per hour in a basically an average size conference room with eight people and one of them has COVID. None of them are wearing masks, but you're a good person and you know that you wanna avoid getting COVID, so you are. 
what's the probability that you get infected? Now, if you weren't wearing a mask, it comes out to about 37%. Now, this is based on the quanta assumptions of uh, an, uh, Omicron, uh, as well as your talking uh, in, in the space that's ventilated to urgent. This is just an estimate, and we're gonna use this. This is not perfect. I wouldn't trust these numbers. I think the, the one thing that frustrates me is that we're three years into this, and we still haven't nailed down those numbers, mostly because we haven't, some specific organizations have not very much adopted that it's airborne transmission, and so they haven't done a lot of research into it, but we really should have. We'll have better estimates, hopefully, over the next year. Okay, so the next important thing is to look at this risk table here, what I have popped up, which is that there are different, cloth, or different uh, respirators that we can use, or masks and respirators that we can use to help reduce it. One thing I like to draw your attention is that cloth masks do work to some level. They do reduce your probability but not significantly. Even if you had a really well-sealed cloth mask, you taped it to your face, you're gonna go from 37% probability of getting infected to 21.8. Okay, not amazing. And that's what we've been saying. Cloth masks, meh, they're okay, they're better than nothing, but they're closer to nothing than they are to better. Surgical masks also show a reduction, but you really need to make sure they're sealed to your face. Most surgical masks, we're gonna see fit factors of around a half to something like that. So 30% might be the best you might do with a surgical mask, so you're doing, reducing it about 17%. Now let's look at N95s. A very poorly fitted N95, 16%, but if you can get a really tight seal, we're getting that to about 1%. Let's start at that 1%. Actually, excuse me, I'm gonna take that back. Let's start at 5%, it brings you to 3.4. It's much better for the analysis. It brings us to 3.4%. Now the question is, which way should we move? If we move down in our table, we're going through improving filtration efficiency. So if you see at 5% face seal leakage, which is about what I think you can best you can kind of do without using a port account or some sort of other uh, qualitative fit testing mechanism. So if you're just trying it on and kind of think that you got a really good fit, kind of my experience working with people is about 5% is about the furthest you can tell. Beyond that, it's kind of tough. So let's assume you're at that point. Should you buy a P100? Well, unless you know that P100 is gonna seal your face better, because a P100, if we go down on the table, is only gonna take us from 3.4% probability to 3.1% not really a huge improvement. We're gonna talk about the penalty with that too. But if we stick with that N95, and instead of going to a P100, we focus on getting uh, a really good face seal. So this would be either purchasing a qualitative fit tester, doing some of the do-it-yourself examples uh, that are out on the web, or in my opinion, the best solution is getting a quantitative port account fit test. Uh, there are solutions that are available if you search uh, industrial hygiene or occupational medicine and qualitative or fit test or port account fit test and call around. You can sometimes get these done, it costs a hundred bucks. It's unfortunately way too hard to do. We should have tons of these at Open Arrows. We're working on that. Uh, but right now that's about the best you can do. But if you focus on really getting a good face seal, you can see that going from 5% leakage to 1% leakage has a significant reduction when wearing an N95. Five, from going from 3.4% to 1.1%. That's a three X reduction. That's a big deal, right? One in a hundred chance of getting COVID is for spending an hour with a bunch of people in a conference room. I think that's a significant improvement. I still think this is actually an overestimate, but let's just use it for today. Okay, now what happens is you can go one of two ways. Let's say you get 1%. Do you go to a P100? It does improve it, but it's not significant when we look at overall the rate. It is, you know, basically a 33% reduction, but relative to the total magnitude, it's not getting that much better. And you can drive to the far left corner, which would be getting a really great seal with an N95 or a P100, um, and that's 0.1%. So there's definitely improvements to make, but the, the relative delta relative to the infection with no mask or these other conditions is getting kind of marginal. And I think that that's the argument that I'm trying to make is that you should focus first on getting good face seal. If you know you have a good face seal and you have a mechanism to do it, then you can start about thinking about upgrading it. But I'm gonna make the case that there's a cost to it and that's what's next. So what's next is uh, pressure drop. And I like to think of pressure drop as the cost. So when we go buy gas, uh, we think about miles per gallon, right? How many, how far can I go for the cost or something like that? And pressure drop is our cost mechanism. Meaning if we want better filtration, it ain't coming for free, it's gonna come for the increase in pressure drop. And pressure drop is a measure of breathability. Lower number is better. So lower pressure drop means less resistance to breathing. And that's what we're looking for. So what we want is low pressure drop numbers. And if we pull back up, the data that we had uh, from my assumptions and the previous one I'm switching to, you can see the pressure drop data here for the, th the two different masks. So you can see that there's an increasing rate. Now in 95 data I used it's 80 pascals, which is roughly about the average based on my data that's interpolated against AccuBed and some other test data. It's not perfect, but it's just a good starting point. Uh, I also looked at some NIOSH data. Now 
I don't have a ton of N100, P100 data, so I kind of looked around there and I got about 190. So you can see that going to higher filtration efficiency comes with the expense of pressure drop. So how does that translate into what we're talking about in terms of risk? And that's where I think this analysis is kind of interesting. So what I'm doing in this next table is calculating how much protection do you get for each pa Pascal of pressure drop. And in this table that I'm sticking up here, a higher number is better, meaning it's a better deal. It costs you less. So if we look at, say, the N95, we're getting around at 5% you know, leakage, about 12.7 percentage of protection for each Pascal of pressure drop. It's kind of a weird way to think of it, but that's roughly what it is. Higher number is better, meaning we're getting a lot of protection without a lot of that cost pressure drop because they're much easier to breathe in. If we look at the same condition with the N100 versus P100, we see that number drops to five, meaning it didn't, because of the face leakage, it didn't really give us a ton more uh, fil didn't, didn't give us a ton more protection, but it only cost us more in terms of pressure drop. So this is kind of my argument, that N95s really sit at the sweet spot because they actually filter at much higher rates. They have really good breathability because they don't have to deal with the oily aerosol portion of it, meaning their filter media can be a little bit higher quality in terms of the quality factor. Um, so you get better breathability with it. And since we're not really dealing with oily aerosols, we're kind of paying a penalty for that extra bump in filtration efficiency that isn't necessarily there uh, with an, that you necessarily need with COVID. And so this table, again, everything's available down there. It's kind of showing you the cost. And so the best deal is the N95. Now there's other ways to slice and dice this up that you can get kind of different analysis. But I think in general, this is what it shows is that the filtration efficiency versus the pressure drop, depending on face seal, is really what determines whether you should go to, a, a, in my opinion, a P100 or an N100 respirator. And I think my recommendation first is if you're thinking about it, focus on getting a good face seal. It's gonna buy you more protection than simply going to a P100. Now I will caveat that with one thing, that P100s and N100s typically, if they're the disposable style, will have some slight differences than a normal respirator. In fact, this, this uh, Spirion here has a soft foam seal. I got a couple over here from my friends at Moldex. They had sent them over. These are the uh, N100s and P100 airwaves, which have a lower pressure drop than that. So again, this analysis isn't necessarily representative of every P100 or N95, but I think it's relative. If I took the same series of airway mask from N95 to P100, I think this, air, this would still be uh, an accurate analysis for those style of masks, um, but not necessarily across different brands. So the basic gist of that is that there are these and they feature the same thing. Otherwise, uh, relative to the other Moldex ones, they feature this soft foam insert. So they do have some things that actually help improve seal. So there sometimes can be a benefit to that. But again, without doing some fit testing, it's hard to tell if that foam is really gonna do much for you. So I, I can't stress enough. It's more important to think about fit than the filtration efficiency at this point. When you get to N95, if you wanna go further, focus on fit. If you get fit and you still want more protection, then you can think about a P100 or N100, but the amount that they're buying you is getting much, much smaller for each thing. And in my opinion, the best bang for And transition, someone's gotta cut that guy off. He just never shuts up. Anyways, in summary, the key thing that I wanna take away from this is that it is all still about fit, fit, fit. So as always, if you have any comments, Toss them below. I'll do my best to answer them. Check me out on Twitter, at MassNerd. Uh, do a little discussion there, but have been very busy at work, so not super active, but I'll do better. And as always, we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks a ton.